I think of my mind as a compost heap. I just keep putting all these crazy, sometimes dead things in there, and then... Are you ready? All right, let's go. Manufacturing is sexy. Sounds crazy? Just wait. I'm Z Holly, host of The Art of Manufacturing, your behind-the-scenes look at how people who make stuff are trying to make it in their industries. If you've ever wondered how to build a brand, a business, or just a better mousetrap, tune in and enjoy. This week, we're talking with Mark Fuller, founder and CEO of Wet Design. If you've seen the Fountains of Bellagio or the Dubai Fountain, that is Wet Design's work. Mark and his team created the industry of high-tech water fountains in the early 80s, and they keep innovating the medium today. I toured their facilities and was curious what was up with the various labs, the vapor deposition chamber, and the secret passageway to boxing gyms and hidden offices. It was totally crazy. And I wanted to learn where they came from and what was next. What do textile engineers, woodworkers, robot designers, optics experts, and choreographers have to do with water fountains? We hear about that and a whole lot more on this week's episode of The Art of Manufacturing. Wet is uh, a really fun, many would say crazy, agglomeration of about 250 people. And you have to look pretty hard through the average university course catalog to find a discipline that we don't have represented here. Uh, I mean, we have theatrical arts. In fact, we have an Academy Award winner on staff, been with us since very nearly the beginning. We have optical engineers, we have fabric designers, textile designers, graphic artists, architects, landscape architects, mechanical engineers, machinists, woodworkers. I'll take a deep breath. A gym trainer. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we're we're going to ask you about that one later, because that one is a really (laughs) wild one. (laughs) So, uh, you know, the projects that you've had, obviously the iconic Bellagio Fountain and Dubai Fountain, um, what are, sort of what what would you say is your favorite (laughs) one, or the most iconic ones? And then your Follow-up question will be, which of my children is my favorite child? I know, right? don't you hate, I hate when people <laughs> ask me questions like that. <laughs> um, well, my favorite fountain is always the one that we have just finished or are just about to finish because that's new and fresh and exciting and, and challenging. Um, with a little bit of historical perspective, of course, the Fountains of Bellagio, is, uh, it never escapes my mind. It's It was a uh, groundbreaking. Can you break ground with a fountain? Or what should that be? Water surface <laughs> well, water breaking jets or something? Are yeah. doing all sorts of crazy <laughs> stuff these days. <laughs> um, so what what inspired you to work with water and to create a create a company like this? Really, a company that had never been created like this before. You know, I I've always been fascinated by water. I, I love to play with it as a kid. Um, I grew up in Salt Lake City, where we have very cold, very snowy winters. And we lived on a hill, and so right after the snow, as it would start to melt, these torrents of water would come rushing down uh, the street, and and, uh, I would have great fun on my way home from school, this is grade school, building these snow dams and causing the cars to veer into the opposing (laughs) lanes of traffic. (laughs) Little mischief, which I think is still present in wet, lots of water, which clearly is. Um, Then when I went to um, college, University of Utah, uh, my th- I did a thesis at the undergraduate level. My thesis was, and this is this is one I um, don't ask me to spell it for you. Axisymmetric laminar fluid flow, but it's the basis for the leapfrog fountain and those crystal clear <laughs> jets that we um, worked on. That that was a thesis project. And when I went to Stanford for my master's degree, uh, that also was based around fluids and water. So it's something that's just, uh, I'm afraid to cut myself. It might not be blood that comes out. It might, <laughs> might be clear water. I don't know. So tell me about what prepared you for this then, because um, it is really not a, something that's been, that was done before. So how did you, how did you get there? I was a child who, whenever I was asked from a very tiny age, um, do you know what you want to be when you grow up? I always had an answer, immediate answer. Now, it changed about 40 times over the years, (laughs) but there was never a moment when I said, oh, I don't know, maybe I'll go to business school or figure it out when I get big. At one point in my life, I I wanted to be a paleontologist. Um, At one point in my life, I wanted to be um, a railroad engineer, not a building engineer. And I wanted to be a chemical engineer. And I um, nearly completed a second degree in theater arts, technical theater, not not performance. Um, So I... I, I find things interesting. Um, in fact, the, one of the main components that we look for when we interview prospective people to join our WET team is curiosity and interest in a wide variety of topics. Um, that, that stuff always 
comes together. Um, I was I was uh, jokingly describing myself and my mind to someone the other day, and I said, when I was a kid in, in Utah, the leaves all, we, it's this high, highly seasoned state, so in the fall, mm-hmm. the leaves drop off the trees, and Dad always had my my uh, brother and I rake up the leaves, and then he'd dig a big old hole in the backyard and bury the leaves and put soil on them, and, and he called it a compost uh, pile. And then in, in in the spring, it would get really warm, the leaves would ferment, and, and you'd get this wonderful, rich um, fertilizer for the garden out of it. And I think of my mind as a compost heap. I just keep putting all these crazy, sometimes dead things in there, and then <laughs> later on they start to smolder, and heat comes out, and you never know, you know, what 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 will spring forward from that. I love that. It's like the failures are kind of the compost. They for the are. Next thing they, they're times, the right? best. Yeah. <laughs> and so you launched this company out of Disney, really back in the eighties, right? Yes, I. Um, I uh, had the good fortune to do, uh, I was in the special effects department, not for the movies, but for the theme parks when I was at Disney. I was there just shy of six years. And one of the opportunities that fell to special effects was to do some interesting water fountains. The most m- memorable of, of them probably was is a leapfrog fountain outside the Kodak Journey into Imagination Pavilion. And uh, we had a lot of fun. The public had a great deal of fun. It was really one of the Although it wasn't nearly as expensive as the major pavilions, it was one of the most talked about things at the Epcot opening. And because we did some things with fountains that just were never done before. Um, now that started a little bit of an interesting story. Uh, Disney, which was like the best, I can't say enough good about uh, working for Disney, the best postgraduate opportunity imaginable coming out, mm-hmm. out of Stanford. And the company had committed to simultaneously do Tokyo Disneyland and Epcot Center, which just stretched everyone. So as we were coming close to a committed opening, um, some of the senior management were in a meeting, and I was there and scratching their heads. And we have have this park kind of area outside the Kodak Pavilion. It was a 3D theater. And when people come out, we don't know what to have them do. We, We like a playground, but if we put jungle gym equipment, it doesn't seem very innovative, and maybe kids will fall off. And 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 I. Just blurt it out. I've got this idea. If you if you let me run this project, I'll build an interactive, imaginative park with fountains like no one has ever seen before. And Marty Sklar, who uh, was uh, the creative head of Walt Disney Imagineering, um, said, Mark, if you can do it on time and on budget, let's consider it done. Because he, he was on to the, the much really bigger issues of the main major pavilions. And we did it. We we opened the Leapfrog Fountain, which is those clear streams of water that jump around. And and part of our self-prescribed mission to make these fountains different was we said we're going to have no bodies of water, no ponds. These fountains will come right out of the gardens. And we're going to make these the water elements not look like fountains, but we're going to give them a personality. And, of course, we were in and amongst all the great Disney animators and so forth. So they were able to program the the water elements with with personalities, just like you see in you know as a, in an animated character in a film. And then we did the pop jets, these little tiny marbles of water. I mean, that whole fountain, all the water in the air at any given time wouldn't half fill uh, the coffee cup I have here. And there's a personality in those. And then we did a, another fountain called the jellyfish. And then we did a, a waterfall, but we called it the upside down waterfall. The water runs up the face of the waterfall. And we had a lot of fun. Um, we had some crazy near misses which um we almost didn't make it a few times and when we opened it uh, it really set up a, a new description of what fountains of the then 20th century were like really cool and then you decided to spin it out you you could do it you you couldn't do it within disney or you didn't want to do it within disney <clears throat> well i was uh, a, a very happy disney employee there um and uh, of course with those two projects open everyone was kind of relaxing with uh some cutbacks in staff and so forth and so we were doing, uh, I guess you'd say, follow-up and, and clean-up activities, but the phones would start to ring, and calls would, would come back to me, typically like from a developer, you know, developing a shopping center or, or some kind of project, and say, wow, we've just seen that fountain. We'd like to talk to the person who did it, uh, and, and I'd immediately cut them off and, and say, uh, well, that was my team, but um, we only work for Disney. And one very persuasive gentleman, I well remember his name, Tom Gaffney, was working for Criswell Development out of Dallas. And he said, no, Mark, we're doing a massive project uh, by the architect I.M. Pei, full city block. 
And the name of the project is Fountain Place. With that name, we have to have something spectacular. He said, can I fly you out here? Is there any way you could moonlight or consult for us? So I grabbed a couple of my colleagues there in the special effects group, and we got permission from Disney, um, and we flew out there, and we started moonlighting, and we designed that fountain, and then later that um, we we exited Disney on, on great terms and have since consulted back to them, but we started our own little company. Uh, our test lab was my kitchen sink. Um, mm-hmm. Our finance department consisted of my running up 13 credit cards to their limit, and Alan and Melanie, my two partners, and I not taking a salary for about three months. So any aspiring entrepreneurs, there's a kickoff plan for you. (laughs) (laughs) Bellagio fountains, have to ask about that. I mean, that really was the iconic fountain that you created. Uh, Well, of course, the the downside of, of starting at such a literally impoverished level was the, the you know sort of the hockey puck curve of growth that you you do we we grew a little and and um, financed ourselves bootstrapped uh, I think they call it and the, we had a number of really interesting larger opportunities along the way which were great fountains we did the Tokyo Dome Stadium uh, in Japan and and so forth but I, I would say the the major turning point was when uh, Mr. Wynn, Steve Wynn contacted us through his landscape architect, Don Brinkerhoff, and, and laid out his vision. He flew my wife, Susan, and I up for dinner and, and described, as, as only Steve Wynn can do, uh, it makes it real before your eyes, his vision of the Bellagio Hotel and most especially the lake out front. He said, Mark, I want people here to not think they're in Las Vegas. I want them to lose themselves entirely from the environment. I want the people on the street to enjoy this. They don't have to be necessarily in my property. And I feel it should be driven by music, and it should be like something no one has ever seen before, and it should be the biggest thing that you imagine you'll ever do in your life. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> like, how could you refuse that? What do you that? say? Right, what do you say? Yeah. And, and, uh, that, and that was three years, I, almost to the week, I guess, of when from that dinner to when we opened Bellagio. How, that, how many? Three years. Wow. And in the meantime, he, he, Steve said, you know, let's get to know each other, make sure this is going to work out. He said, I've never been totally satisfied with the um, Mirage fountain up front, I mean, which is a, which is a, 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 a neat in, um, simulation of a volcano. He said, I'd like to redo that. And we did that. We, we, we um, redid all that for him, and that worked out very well for everyone. And that was kind of partway through continuing to design the Bellagio. And so how did that go from a technological standpoint? Did you have any big... Uh innovations or you because you have, I mean these are huge huge fountains well part of what um, our core design philosophy at wet is about keeping things simple I mean you you see a lot of and there were musical fountains you know when I was a kid even but they're they're kind of like one of these jets and two of those and kind of like a chocolate box sampler a little of this and a little of that and and no real feeling to them and for that reason they all pretty much look alike and when we started wet, we thought we would take, first of all, we defined ourselves as working with water as the sculptural and performative element. Because most classical fountains, there's a giant stone horse with water, you know, coming out of its mouth or, or a piece of statuary or something like that. And water is is kind of, um, you know, frosting on the cake or whatever you want to call it. And we said, let's just work with water. We'll make everything all but invisible. So people, the focus is on the magic of the water. So when we had this nine-acre lake of Bellagio in front of us, we wanted to create something that would be lasting and, and, and that we could continue to create pieces with. And as we were discussing it, Steve turned to me one day and he says, Mark, you know what we're creating here? We're creating the world's largest musical instrument. Piano's got 88 keys. We have like mm-hmm. over a thousand different keys, if you want to call them that, in terms of visual expressions that we can work with music mm-hmm. to do that. So we kept it very simple. There's a, those of you who've seen it, a big arc sweeping across it and three um, areas of circles. And so from that, and when you look at it, you think this is boring, but uh, so is a piano, piano keyboard, right? It's boring. It's a <laughs> black and white keys all in a row. How creative is that? But it it's that basic primitive essential building block elements. Um, I mean, the periodic table is boring, right? Just, by, you know, 100 plus a few things and everything in life and in, in the it's universe is made of them. So that's our approach to fountain design. So we created, uh, we've done a little bit of work with something we called air-powered technology, which fills a, a tube with water and then uses a, 
a burst of compressed air to shoot it out like a big, almost a missile into the sky. That's a very staccato expression. And so where is the legato? And for that, we decided, uh, and this scared a lot of us to death, we had to do an underwater robot that would move around in with all of the grace and so forth that you'd want, you know, in, in conducting a visual symp- uh, symphony. And, and so we immediately started looking at industrial robots, and you see them all the time, right? The, the robots that paint cars on a, on a Ford or General Motors commercial or do the welding. But they go from point A to point B as efficiently as possible, and they're anything but graceful and anything but um, something that, that you would uh, blend with, with a theatrical performance. So we had on our staff at the time uh, a woman who had been in training for the astronaut program, PhD, brilliant person. She put together a team of in-house and outside people, and we created a program called Virtual Wet, which would enable us to simulate on a computer screen um, in 3D exactly how every particle of water would perform, whether the wind would blow it and how gravity would affect it and light and so forth. And uh, and then it would spit out these like gazillion lines of computer code that would control all <laughs> these jets. Um, we did this all a number of 15, 18 years ago, so the computers wow. were a little slower then, to say the least. And we ended up with a Bellagio. We we invited some uh, exceptional choreographers, uh, Kenny Ortega, who everyone knows from Michael Jackson fame and, and his great movies and, and television series. And uh, he choreographed a number of the pieces with us. And he said, Mark, this is like working. He said, I can get comedy i can get humor i can get dramatic uh gestures out of your water jets as though i were working with a cast of of live dancers he says this is just amazing and kenny's continued to continue to work with us on a number of projects since so tell me more about the technology so how how do you actually make these things work well let me tell you uh, if you think a robot is complicated and they are Try sticking one underwater. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but most of these things aren't robots, right? I mean, are they mainly nozzles? You invented this nozzle. Um, what's what's the key behind making it work? Well, when we started wet, and this is something uh, probably a little known secret, but but our initial ambition was we weren't going to make any equipment. Actually, I don't I don't know where we had this idea, but it seemed like well, that's sort of. Uh, I don't know, dirty or beneath us. We're going to create these fantastic visions and and, and uh, you know beautiful gestures, and then we'll just subcontract out the equipment and have it built. Um, and that was great for less than a year because we thought, well, if only somebody made a gizmo that did this. Ah, but they don't. If only somebody, and we so we kept ba- immediately banging our heads with the limits of known fountain technology. And we try to adapt some industrial technology and stuff. So quickly, we we put together a group of in-house engineers and and uh, that later grew to in-house manufacturing to invent stuff that nobody was crazy enough to have invented before. I mean, we don't make pumps, right? I mean, there's a great number of pumps, large, small, fast, slow, out there. So even to this day, we specify pumps. But when we wanted a, a, a robot that would move with the grace uh, of a ballerina, we there are no industrial robots hmm. to do that. So um, we worked with a state-of-the-art robotics company, uh, Sarcos, out of Utah at the time to collaborate because we were small. And so we created what we wanted it to do, and they engineered and and built those. And we now have gone many generations beyond that and engineer and and build them in-house. But the the vertical jets, let me me go back to that for a minute, because they're they're so simple and so really magnificent. You... you, um, I mean, if you if you suck water into a drinking straw and then tip your head straight up and then go, you know, whoosh, blow it out, you you there's a little puff of air from your cheeks, right? Blows this water out. So we we took a tube, a pipe, and we put it in the water, and the bottom end's open, and so the pipe just is at the top of the pipe's at the water level, and so it gurgle gurgle, the whole pipe fills with water. Uh, Bellagio is about 13 feet deep in its deepest point, so you got this pipe you know, say say six inches in diameter and 13 feet long, and it's full of water. And then we put this little flapper valve on the bottom that's a check valve, it, so water can come in. It's like a heart valve, if you've ever seen the uh, illustration of those, and then, it, and then it shuts. And then we burst a, a big blast of compressed air in near the bottom, and it can't go out the bottom, so it pushes the water all out of the top. If you put the air in really slowly, like fizzing, the air would fizz out. But when you blow it in at high pressure, it forms kind of a balloon and just lifts the water out of the top. And the wonderful thing about this is, 
uh, if you think of conventional fountains with, with miles of pipe and electric underwater motors and all the energy it consumes, all we're doing is a little, a little compressed air and a pipe with a fancy valve on the bottom. So we were able to put a 1,000 plus of these jets in there for very reasonable costs, not only in installation, but in terms of operation. Um, actually, that technology uses less than 20%, less than one-fifth of the energy that if we had tried to do the same thing with conventional fountain technology. Hmm. And um, flashing back to my my college days in civil engineering, which in those days really encompassed environmental engineering, and I've always been um, very taken and interested in that, and in how to conserve power and, and water in the work that we do. Um, and so I, we were really proud of ourselves. Here's a fountain that's spectacular and large and very conservative on... Uh, energy. Uh, the latest figure I've heard from the Bellagio folks, and if you've seen one of those musical shows, there's, I don't know, thousands or 10,000 or something people out there, and they use about $50 worth of electricity to produce that entire show. Really? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? That's crazy. Yeah. That's a and few years ago. Maybe it's, maybe it's 55 today. I don't know. But it's The something water, like too. People probably are like, oh, well, you're in the desert. Why are you yeah. using all this water? Yeah, oh, but, and that was so interesting because if you remember what was there before, it was the Dunes Golf Course. And we looked up the figures. The The water that they use to irrigate the Dunes Golf Course is more than the water we use in that fountain. I mean, the only water we have to put in is whatever a little bit's evaporated every day, right, once it's filled. And how many how many foursomes can play through on an 18-hole golf course in, in a day? Not very many people. And we've got, like I say, tens of thousands out there enjoying that for less water usage than was used to irrigate mm. that golf course. And then we got... I, I think r- rather clever with the building engineers. When when you build a, a big hotel like that, and they had 3,000 rooms on opening day, you have to be able to put out any kind of a fire real fast. So you have to have this massive amount of water in giant tanks or something. And we got with the fire control engineers, and we just used that lake. We cross-plumbed it. So if there's a fire, that wa- that is the fire protection body of water. So Amazing. It, it's pumped up there. So it's dual use, so the practical side and the inspirational side both. That's very cool. You're listening to The Art of Manufacturing. Join the conversation on social at We Make It in LA and our Facebook group, makeitinla.org slash community. We'll be right back after this break. The Art of Manufacturing podcast is a collaboration with Make It in LA, which is generously supported by organizations like the LA Cleantech Incubator. LACI has a really cool facility in the Arts District of downtown LA filled with energetic startups and nonprofits. They offer cleantech startups flexible office space, epic prototyping labs, and the number one rated cleantech incubation program in the world. Learn more at makeitinla.org slash LACI. We're speaking with Mark Fuller, the creator of iconic water features like the Fountains of Bellagio and the Cauldron for the Salt Lake City Olympic Games. So we're approaching uh, the opening of the Bellagio. It's in front of the hotel. This is not some little thing that can open late. And we had a number of problems. Uh, the one that I particularly remember is we, we tested these jets here in uh, Los Angeles, shooting them up, uh, I don't know, 80 or 100 feet. And we thought, okay, we don't really have room to, to do a full test, but we're going to go up to over 200 feet in Bellagio. And we just scaled up and put more air pressure in. Well, we have this line of... of uh, like a thousand jets and we're running the music and it's some number of weeks before opening Mr. Wynn's out there and everyone watching it and the the jets if you've seen the Bellagio they fire off like um, pulses of water like kind of firecrackers pop 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 in, in exact beat with the music when we want it to be sometimes we want to go counter to the music that's part of the creative choreography but what you don't want is for them to just stick open and sputter like you know if, if, like somebody just goes <laughs> I don't know how that comes across on the mic, but that's that's how these things look when that valve sticks open. They just blow water and 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 uh, uh, I guess the medical term is sputum on a grand scale <laughs> up on the top of the surface. And part way through, one of these would stick, and then uh, 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 you know, half an hour later, another one would stick. And we assumed, oh my gosh, it's a brand new fountain. Pipes are new and everything. There's probably sand or grit or something from the welding guys that's gotten in there and, and clogged the valve. So. Uh, the the water was very warm. It was, it was summer. It's like swimming pool temperature. And so we'd send our divers out. They'd go to the bottom of this 13-foot lake, uh, take out the valve, bring it up to the surface. We'd put it on the bench by the side of the lake, carefully take it apart, inspect it. Nothing was wrong. No dirt, <laughs> nothing. Put it back together, take it in the lake, works great. And then it doesn't. So after you know 10 or 20 successful fires, it, it starts to misbehave again. 
Well, this was driving us crazy. Mr. Wynn was looking at me like, we are going to get this fixed by opening, Mark, right? Well, so how many <laughs> how many days or weeks oh, do you have? Like, like... I, this is, this is I, I, less than a month. I don't remember. Some, <laughs> I mean, this is, we're down to the line. We're, oh by, my God. we're choreographing. I, we're actually weeks because we're uh, creating the music. Kenny Ortega's out there, and we got these, these misbehaving jets, which really stand out uh, and, and ruin the show. So I had gotten to know uh, when, uh, years earlier um, some gentleman at Caltech in the fluid mechanics uh, department there in engineering and brought them in and said, what, what, what can be going on there? And they ran a thermodynamic analysis and said, and I'll refer here to if anybody's ever taken a, a, a spray can of anything, paint, hairspray, anything like that, and if you just hold the button down for a while, the can gets the cold Bernoulli in your hand. The effect. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it <laughs> expands, go. right? And, yep. and, it's in a, and as the air expands, Dropping it sucks pressure. energy out and mm-hmm. it gets cold. Well, this high pressure air that can now go 20 stories high that we were using there, as it, as it ripped through this little control valve underwater, it expanded and got exceptionally cold. And what would happen is that just the humidity, and, and Las Vegas is not terribly humid, but the humidity in that air would actually build up an ice ball in the middle of that Crazy. valve. So after 10 or 20 shots, its throat was was frozen solid. It would stick open and, and then misbehave. And, and then it would melt and there was no, yeah, there's no, no evidence. There's no evidence, right. Like the Ed Brown Post story of the, the murder committed with an ice, <laughs> you know, uh, ice dagger and it melts before the cops come. So we, our divers, in bringing this to the surface, uh, the ice was long melted, but it, it was fine. So we went back and forth and back and forth. And uh, we finally figured out it, fixes are simple. Often once you understand the problem, we, we put a what's called an orifice, a small hole downstream of the valve. That was the smallest thing. So the ice form there instead of in our valve. And to this day, if you look carefully at the Bellagio fountain, after one of those jets fires, you'll see a tiny little bit of what looks like white mist coming up out of the jets. Those are tiny ice crystals, but wow. they're formed now where they can't cause us our problems. Very, very cool. <laughs> and scary. Wow. Down the wire. <laughs> down to the, and then down you don't to the even wire. know what's going on. Oh wire. my God. So uh, looking back, I mean, that was, that was a while ago that you did that and it's still really, uh, feels very cutting edge and I'm wondering what you see are the trends that you're excited about or the future of the technology for these types of because we, you, I saw an amazing tour of a lot of the things that you're working on and behind the scenes fire and all sorts of crazy, a lot of stuff. crazy stuff so what can you talk about <laughs> well um your your point about the Bellagio still being classic and and we look for all of our pieces to be classic because if you tie to a to a trend I mean if you you know, look at how cell phones have evolved, and you look at some of the ones that first came out. They're they're almost laughable. It was mm-hmm. a few years ago because they're so about the technology. We're about the experience. Um, nobody laughs at the Statue of Liberty and says, "What a ridiculous piece of old technology <laughs> they used to make that!" Right? Um, or 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 a great movie or a great novel. And so the Bellagio will last, independent of technology moving on, because the technology enabled us to do what we wanted to do. And the fact that there's something you know different or cooler now does not obsolete that. And that's the one of the hallmarks we look for in all of our work. We are, of course, always looking for amazing new tools, um, fire, crazy things with water and color and light and what you can do with LED lights these days and uh, different forms of water, you know, vaporous water, ice. We've done some amazing things intentionally with ice, not accidentally like we had at the Bellagio. <laughs> <laughs> so my, I, when I was a kid, my dad did a lot of these laser light shows and, you know, water some some water integrate with them and uh he used to put do these experiments in our backyard in our swimming pool and so i grew up with those sorts of things and so he he was very excited that we were going to chat and he said he was just curious if you had integrated any lasers and other you know what are what are you excited about around the lighting of these installations we typically um don't use lasers a lot in our work um and we we did a lot when i was at disney and 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 they're they're great when they have uh a purpose. Um, they're a technology that sort of screams, I'm a laser beam, and, and people in the early days were fascinated just because of that. But as I say, we try to keep the technology behind mm-hmm. the scenes and focus just on the expression. I'll, I'll remember, um, we were so excited the first time we shot off the big shooters and Steve Wynn was there. And and he, along with us, we were all dancing like kids up and down and clapping. This is so amazing. This thing going like you know, over 20 stories high in, in, in like a second or something. And we thought, boy, we got a home run here. Mr. Wynn's so happy. The next night he came out and we were struggling with the choreography and he, and he kind of chewed us out. 
And I thought, well, this is a downer. You were so happy last night. And he, he said, guys, this may be the tallest fountain today. People will beat that. That's a technology feat. Mm. We have to create an art piece here, a performance piece that you know, nobody says this movie is better than one that Hitchcock made or anything right. like that. Right. So I, that was a valuable, one of many lessons I learned from Mr. Wynn. That's I, interesting. So he actually kind of drove that, some he, of that he, philosophy. He, oh, he's he's an incredibly creative uh a person and and doesn't get stuck on 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 whatever the the techno tricks are that enable it. They're just there to you know to enable the the, the magical expression. Mm, mm. And what I think is really interesting. A lot of times when people think about manufacturing, they think about it being mass produced something that's mass produced. But what you're doing is you're really every single one is custom. Do you consider that manufacturing? You know, that's interesting. Manufacturing, and, and when you go to school and, and, and you take manufacturing, engineering, and all this stuff, they, uh, well, I, I guess this came out in the, sort of in the 50s, and the emphasis on um, efficiency and, and that type of thing is like, the more you can make, the lower the price can be, and, and on and on. And we are about custom uh, individual uh, elements. Uh, we're not about replicating, you know, oh, this is a big Bellagio, a little Bellagio, a variation on Bellagio at all. And so what we've had to do is is take and say, how do we uh, create adaptive manufacturing um, that's really unique to one-of-a-kind thing? And, and other companies are now doing somewhat similar. Like Nike, you know, you can sort of design your one-of-a-kind shoes and have a build as opposed to just picking some catalog things, right, and, and, and other companies do. It's, it, but it really flies in the face of, of uh, the most of the early 20th century thoughts on manufacturing. Um, I tell my kids... Uh, especially when they were younger and loved to play with Legos, you, you know, you can, there's a certain number of standard Lego blocks, and you can stack them in all sorts of different ways. Mm-hmm. You can make a castle, you can make a race car, you can make a robot. But generally, whenever you buy another kit of Legos, there's a few new parts you never saw before. Mm-hmm. So what we do at WET, we have our big engineering group um, that engineers the features uh, in accordance with their, our design vision and restacks you know, the little valves or the robots and stuff in different ways. And then we have our product engineering group that comes up with new devices. So those are the new one-of-a-kind Legos. And so there would be a few of those in each feature we do. And, and so our overall uh, toy drawer of Legos is, just gets bigger every year. <laughs> <laughs> you do have a lot of toys. We do talk, have a lot of toys. <laughs> ta- talk a little bit about the facilities that you have here because uh, I was just blown away. It's I was like a kid in the candy store. <laughs> you know, there there are two different ways you can walk through wet. I, I And I, I'll give you both, including the, the description I didn't give you when we did our earlier walkthrough. Uh, the sensible way, let's say, is that we've evolved to build pretty much everything that we need to create things here. Uh, at some point in my life, I thought, you know, if we had the ability to bend sheet metal, we could make a lot of very interesting mechanical things, um, much less expensively and more reliably than we could just milling them out of big, big hunks of steel. And then we moved into plastic manufacturing and injection molding and an environmentally uh, sensitive painting and, and coating was, which within the last year we've we brought some new technology in house. Um, and then we've expanded out into uh, exploration, kind of upstream a step of engineering. We have a, a, a we went you and I went through at a chemistry lab that's as good as any top level university research lab. And, and why an, would you want chemistry lab? And, <laughs> and why would we want a chemistry lab? Because water is really a foundational part of chemistry, right? I mean, um, uh, the contaminants in water, the properties of water, the optical properties of water. How can we take uh, gray water or or crappy water in part of the world where that's all there is? And polish it and purify it so little kids can have fun and, and play in it there. Um, you know, uh, just a, a lot of things uh, with water. And, and and then adjacent to water, water can also take a look at the Grand Canyon. Water can be pretty ferocious when it <laughs> puts its mind to it. Um, water can attack even seawater just goes through stainless steel like it's not there. So how, mm-hmm. what kind of coatings and, and corrosion preventive uh, substances and so forth uh, uh, that are, again, environmentally um friendly and compatible. So our chemistry lab does all of that. And we have an optics lab. We have a wood shop where we do, it's like if you go into a movie studio and you see them building, uh, you know, a, a building and it's thrown up in a few days to look like a building on Main Street someplace and you realize it's it's all paint and, and faux. And we'll build full-scale parts of some of, some of our features here uh, in our, in our out of our carpentry shop in our big uh, studio area so that we can see is this fountain going to be great is it going to be amazing is the splash going to fall where it should be 
uh, you know, we have test labs. We have, you know, you've been through the place, mm -hmm. um, a lot well, of who, stuff. So who gets to use those labs? But the other side of the story I was going to oh, tell you. Oh, right. You could also walk through here and say, everything that Mark liked as a kid to play with, he somehow worked into here. I had a great chemistry set. Ah, the chemistry <laughs> lab. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to say that, but so I, mean, I certainly was thinking that. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, but who, So who gets to use those uh facilities? Well, we use all of our facilities uh, a lot during the day. We have experts in each one. We have some um, amazing uh, woodworkers in our wood shop, and Grosny is our chemist, PhD environmental chemist uh, that we stole away from JPL uh, in the chem mm -hmm. lab. But a lot of these, or all of them, is, uh, we make available to employees here. The wood shop is particularly popular because people, we've got close to a million dollars worth of the finest wood crafting uh, tools there from classic Japanese hand tools to uh, European power tools uh, the size of the room we're sitting in and a lot of people like to build wood things like toys for their kids at Christmas or maybe some furniture for their house or just a hobby project and you have you know some little thing at home but you go through our safety class here and and George teaches you the f you know fundamentals of using these tools and you come in on the evening or weekend or whatever and that's at your hmm. That's at your disposal. So, so Go much fun. Google has their foosball court, but they don't have a wood shop for employees. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me. So that's one thing that's so inspiring to me and I think really resonates with me is your philosophy around building teams and inspiring creativity in your teams. You have such a diversity on your team and in your company. Uh, could you talk a bit about, like, if you were to teach entrepreneurs out there, what are the top key elements of building really creative teams and a creative company culture. Boy, that's such a, a, a powerful and deep and in some ways vexing question. And it's not, there's no pat answer. Over the years, I've, you've, I've seen at least one of my libraries, and I, I'm a voracious reader, including business books. And, you know, do you want a matrix management or, or a siloed management or a project team management and so, so forth? And I, I think all those are, are kind of um, variations on the core idea that you need really great people who have to have the following attributes. When when we hire someone, we look for um, someone who's smart. I, I don't know how to you, – you can just sense it. I suppose uh, – although we don't do this, I, you could say IQ if you were to test somebody. But by that, I mean just somebody who is, is – uh, is a thinker and considers things and, and looks at things and is curious about what's in life. And you can't teach that. You, you, people seem to be born with that or, or not. And then um, we look for passion and commitment, a passion being enthusiasm and commitment being a, a, the extension of that into, into follow through. Um, we like to have some experience and some knowledge, but actually that's the one thing that you continue to gain over life. I don't think you gain passion and commitment, and I don't think you get, you get smarter as you get older. But um, you can continue to add to your body of, of experience and knowledge. So those aspects we know we can teach here if we find the, the other ones. So that's how we tend to screen people, along with where they culture fits. And, and to us, that means um, do, they, do they start everything with, yeah, we can do that, and then figure out how. As opposed to, well, I don't know, this might go wrong and that might go wrong, and I'll get back to you with a study of things. Um, and I'm am amazed at how many folks, uh, I don't know if it's the, the society we live in or just uh, an odd characteristic of human nature, but we weed out an awful lot of people just on that, that they, mm. they just don't start with, I can do it, because that gets you past so many barriers um, that would otherwise stop you. So true. I was thinking, though, the other day that, I think that there's two different ways people deal with uncertainty. Either they say, I can do it, I'm going to do it, and just set these really high yeah. expectations. And then there's also the setting the expectations. I find myself doing that occasionally where I don't want um, – I actually am more likely to take a chance if I set the bar low. And I say, you know what, the, the stakes are not that high. You know, but maybe I don't do it, but let me try. And there's definitely different ways of approaching that uncertainty and uh, maybe it's just that it's that side coming out where they're like, well, I don't want to um, I don't want to scare myself. <laughs> you know, what, what happens if I can't do it? Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and one of my professors, Bob McKim at Stanford, my my advisor, actually, he said, you always want when you, you get a first idea. He says, that's your ace up your sleeve. That's 
you're safe. You know you can come back to that. Feel good about that. Now expose yourself to some risk and look for mm. some you know, some other ways to do it. Because you, in your heart of hearts, you know you can always come back. You're not like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to fail. So try to get that safety card figured out. Mm-hmm. And then you're much more comfortable uh, failing or trying uh, more dangerous but things. But it is really funny how we often, once we get that first idea or the safety card, we just everything is a variation on that first idea. Yeah. So yeah. how do you break people out of that rut? Um, we have a game we play where somebody says, this is my idea, and, and we know they're in love with it and stuff. And we say, ah, guess what? Somebody else patented that. We can't use that at all. <laughs> now what are you going to do? Uh, not necessarily that that's true, but you have to just say, for some exclusionary reason, uh, or we just found out that's going to kill people or whatever. But <laughs> for some reason, we can't do that. So Funny you should say that, though. My very first startup, <laughs> we had an invention, and somebody had patented it. And, uh, and see, we ended up... We, we were very discouraged for about a month, maybe three weeks. And then we said, wait a minute, maybe we can patent around it. And it turns out that our new idea was much, much better. better than the first one. How great is that? <laughs> but if you hadn't, if you would just continued forward with that, you know, right. you would have had the, yeah, the second exactly. best idea. Absolutely. Uh, um, so it's, it's really it's, it's really important to. Um, so you hire well, but that's not enough. Right. I mean, what what now now you have these amazing people. I think a lot of times amazing people are really hard to manage. (laughs) Um, They are. We I have a a colleague, a friend that uh, I went to college with at Stanford, David Kelly, founded, you know, the the great firm. David's so, so bright. Um, And he said to me once, he says, you know, when I formed IDO, he says, you always hear about, you know, you can't be friendly with the people you work with you got to have that workplace home in uh, boundary uh, because otherwise how are you going to discipline somebody if you you know if you if you're friends with them too and david said you know i just i wanted to get a bunch of my friends together and we wanted to work together as friends too and so he said we just tossed that you know old paradigm out, out the window and and he says we started idea with with a bunch of us who were friends and maintained that and that's really spilled over here um and and we encourage that. Uh, I mean, one of the areas that that I walked you through the other day was our gym, right? We've got some actually we have several gyms scattered around our our uh, campus here. And when you go into the gym, whether it's me as CEO or the CFO or somebody from the shop or or a sketch artist or, or or whatever, everybody's the same sort of sweating and oh, I'm not sure if I can lift that weight or you know giving out on the lunges or something. And it's a great equalizer. And we do a a lot of fun. Uh, company events where where management everybody kind of gets silly together or dresses up or or does different things uh and so the 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 you, you leave your rank at the door here an awful lot uh the only people that i lose patience with a lot here are people that are um af- afraid to push back on me i don't mean people should be rude them to me or me to them or anything but it but you want somebody to say excuse me i can I can I suggest something different? I, I think I got a better idea, or maybe we ought to look at this differently. And we have really healthy discussions. And I forget I'm the boss; they forget I'm the boss. I think, and we all hammer it out, and, and um, it works. Yeah, I agree with that. I want pushback because yeah. yeah. then I don't feel like I can put. Because if I, I want to be able to say, "How about this idea?" And you don't want everyone to think, "Oh, that's great," because you're the boss, and yeah. then you don't feel like you can you know, throw your idea in the rain. Absolutely. So, yeah, definitely. Okay, so we have to talk about this gym. Okay. (laughs) The other day, it's like, there's this beautiful little wall. You just push the wall, and all of a sudden, there's a a boxing, there's a gym and a boxing ring, and what's up with that? Well, I was never an athletic kid growing up. Um, And at some point or other, I just – decided to this point in life you know i had to work a little bit on my health um because i'm not going to be like a kid forever and there was a gym across the street a, a, a public gym and i went over there and there was a, a, a boxing coach in a boxing ring and uh jesse was teaching the classes an older fellow and he reminded me of my grandfather my grandfather um who fought under the name of uh frankie smithers he fought in the golden gloves um fights in utah <laughs> And uh, he always wanted to teach me to box as a kid, and I was a little nerd. And I, I grabs. I don't want to do that. So I sadly never put on the, his gloves. But I guess a little bit of nostalgia and a little bit of that. And so I got it in the ring a few times, and it was so fun. I mean, and in three minutes, you can. It's like cardio. Uh-huh. It, you know, you can go around the block or spend forever on some running machine. It's great exercise. So we, we. We decided, well, instead of having everybody go across the street and work and stuff, we had a little warehouse um, building here. We 
built first one little gym and then another, and, and one of them's a boxing gym. Uh, ours is a little different. You know, when you hear the word ring, that sort of means round to me, and all the boxing rings you see are square. So that didn't make sense to my simple mind. So we have one of the world's few round boxing rings. <laughs> I think. Other than that, it's pretty classic. And uh, Alec does boxing classes. They're really popular with with the female and male employees alike mm-hmm, here. Mm-hmm. And we do weight training and we do all sorts of things. We have a hip-hop class. And again, it's people get together. And we if it isn't a fun place to work, if we're not... How can we expect people to have fun with what we create if we're not having fun in the process mm-hmm. of creating it? You have a very diverse background. I mean, <clears throat> t- tell me a little bit about the your education. Um, I've always been curious and, and like to read and flipped around on what I wanted to be. I had a bunch of wonderful ideas I threw my myself into, but... Um, so I finished high school with a bunch of AP credits and probably could have gotten through college in less than four years. I actually took five full years to graduate with a, a bachelor's degree, uh, not because I'm, I'm slow-witted, but because <laughs> there's a, so many classes I found that were interesting. Um, you know, as a civil engineer, you have to take three quarters of physics. I took 12. <laughs> You're crazy. Uh, <laughs> And I got to pick because the, the, now you, you know, they're not requirements. Like, this looks interesting. I'd like to learn about you know solid state optics, or I'd like to learn about something like this. And um, I wanted to learn a little more about design, so I took the basic design series from the School of Architecture. Um, I and loved, this is University of Utah. Un, University of Utah. Mm-hmm. I I love theater, so I uh, and I'm actually I think just a few credits short of actually having a. a, a bachelor's degree in theater oh really technical theater because i took so many classes from history of theater to scenic painting and special effects and theatrical makeup and and and, uh lighting design i paid through part of my uh, tuition by doing lighting design and and uh, running the sound in the theater and a lot of i was in the honors program which gave us these great small classes in liberal arts and western civ and all that stuff um and all those things interestingly enough have come together i and i i i tell people all the time, especially kids in college, don't ever think there's a class that you won't somehow use. Um, Steve Jobs gave a, a great talk when he mm-hmm. um, his commencement speech at Stanford, and he talked about connecting the dots. And connecting the dots is really important, various disparate things. But that's that's step three. Step two is collecting the dots. Yeah. Because if you don't have dots in your head, you can't connect them, right? Mm-hmm. So, and step one is, is and this is where curiosity comes in, looking for the dots to collect. Mm-hmm. So, um, I think people get carried away in this age of specialization, thinking, well, I'm going to get a PhD in something and be the world's expert on the sort of narrowest slice of this. And that's great for learning and discovery. But I think invention and, and creation comes less from a depth of knowledge than it does from different disparate areas of knowledge that have never bumped into each other before coming together. And and, uh, that's what we do here. I mean, we, you know, where else would you be at a lunch table and, and have a textile designer sitting next to an optical engineer and just, you know, sharing ideas about maybe surfaces and how they reflect light and so forth. And next thing you know, we've we've got a different lens array for one of our (laughs) illumination instruments. Do you have something that you're really excited about that you're working on right now that you can share? Um, something different? Why did you have to spoil that by saying which you could share? Because I have oh, a, I a whole bunch of exciting stuff um, that we're doing. And it's some of it is just extending, um, taking, uh, like like the Bellagio, I said, has a thousand plus jets. We're, we're working on a fountain that has over 10,000 individual jets. So it's like creating, uh, you, you know, uh, like this television set that's in the room with us here, you know, g- gazillions of pixels and think of what we'll be able to do on that. And again, one of them can't stick open, right? So the reliability engineering that's going into that is phenomenal. Um, we we do, uh, because it's it's one of uh, the really f- primitive elements that, that's um, on our planet, fire, along with water. And we're combining those in ways where the water actually looks like it is on fire itself. Mm. Um, Thanks that, for letting me stick my hand in that. Oh, that was quite you've unique. seen that. You've seen that in that mock-up, right? Yeah, that's great. And 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 I think that that pulls back to my crazy theater background that I took as a civil engineer because in every great play or story, you have an antagonist and a protagonist. You know, and and what greater antagonist to water is there than fire i mean you think of them as absolute opposites so right. that we we, cool. we you know we seek out that theatricality it's so funny you're the secret 
secretive nature of this. It just really d- reminds me of Disney too, because I've had many people that many friends that worked at Disney and they've they could never talk about what they were doing <laughs> no. and it was really frustrating. Uh, but that was must have been a big leap for you because you, civil engineer, you were a civil engineer. You go from that to Disney. That's a very different world. Well, I shocked my 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 dear parents with that one because I uh, graduated in civil engineering, ap- applied to a number of grad schools and chose Stanford in civil engineering, of course, for a master's degree. And we were uh, packed all my belongings in our family car. We were, uh, I think, I think poor is, is the most direct <laughs> uh, word uh, relative to most of the lives we live today in this country. And so we were driving across the salt flats, headed to Reno, and then up to, to to Stanford. And partway across that desert, I said, Dad, I've been thinking about it. I don't think I want to be a civil engineer anymore. And, you know, he's undoubtedly thinking all this tuition that we've, you know, we've got a <laughs> foot and everything. And he said, why? And I said, well, Dad, as a civil engineer, your goal is that everything you build doesn't move. I mean, civil engineers <laughs> build bridges, skyscrapers. Like, God, heaven help us if one of those, you know, falls over, moves in some way. And I, I like moving things. I love things that that, that are animated and 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 move around. So I, I I'm going to see if I can switch to mechanical engineering. And my folks were supportive. And I went to the dean of the College of Engineering, and he said, "What are your GREs?" And they were, he's off with well, you can do whatever you want. So I switched into um, mechanical engineering and was looking at what what to go into because uh, as a place like Stanford that's pretty high tech and and the dean said there's this one little crazy department we have we call product design he says the rest of us engineers are don't really understand it because <laughs> it's it's 50% in the college of engineering and 50% in the college of fine arts and this gentleman named Bob McKim heads that department and um it just sounded interesting, and that's 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 where I went. So I remember that program. I oh. actually I almost went to that program, right. and I stayed at MIT oh. because I did the opposite. Where I figured, you know, I think I I wanted more engineering mm-hmm. because I felt like I had done a lot of design. So, um, yeah, that's that was a really really neat program. Very very good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I came out of b- b- primarily being a technical person. I mean, I I had explored and had some interest in in the arts, but I came out of some of those crits. One of our professors, Matt Kahn, was brutal and i mean people would leave just bawling i mean he <laughs> he if you didn't get it he wanted you to feel the pain of not getting it great inspiration one of the uh, most formative people in my life but i remember just choking back tears and some oh. of those crits when he would re- but, and i look back at the stuff i did i deserved it but that's whatever. such a difference in culture though between architecture design the arts etc compared to engineering where in engineering there's a right answer you get the right answer whereas right. there's it's yeah. deeply personal it's very personal and you know one of the great life lessons I, I got from that that's the first time I separated when somebody is criticizing my work from criticizing me as a person or a human being and I try to practice that here when when somebody does something really doesn't work. Um, I'll say stupid. And I say, that's really stupid. I'm not saying you're stupid. You're incredibly smart. <laughs> that is stupid. And, and, and if you can develop that separation, then you say, yeah, I'm smart, but how the heck did I come up with that one? And, and, and take the criticism and, and come into it. Um, I have to tell you one, one side story, a class that I took that was not formally um, in my college program. So I took it at night school while I was at Disney. And it was a memory class because I thought, you know, the, the, the work on your memory a little bit. And the teacher, um, he had one rule in class, which is whenever you you forget something or you get stuck or you get something wrong, what, what people normally do, they get very discouraged. You think, oh, my gosh, how can I not remember that? I studied all last night and I've forgotten. I'm so mad at myself. I'm so stupid. I don't even know why I'm in this class. And you, you go into this mental sinkhole. We've mm-hmm. all been there, right? Uh, you, you see kids come home from school and they're so down on themselves. And the teacher, he said, you've got to stop that because when your mind gets in that state, it is completely closed to learning. So he said, every time one of you finds a mistake that you've made, I want you to applaud yourself. And he says, I don't mean mentally. He says, I mean, I want to hear this. And he made, and we all thought we were like looking like idiots, right, in this <laughs> class. But he insisted when we made a mistake that we would applaud ourselves because he said, first of all, you want to catch your mistake before somebody else catches it. So that's a hero thing. And second of all, you want to say, I found it I, and I can improve. So you'd sit through his class all the time and you'd hear these random little virtual pl- <laughs> applauses. That was one of the most powerful learning skills uh, I've ever mastered. Very, very cool. I want to hear about how you 
almost got fired. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So many stories. Let me let me close my eyes and spin spin the uh, the roulette wheel and, and see where the ball stops. When I w- I'll tell you this one because I, this last weekend I was with my wife Susan and, and uh, my daughter Madison. We were at Disneyland and so we went on one of the rides. The first ride that I worked on when I was at Disney, which is Big Thunder Mountain. And if you've been on Big Thunder Mountain, you remember that these uh, they call them lifts where the you know the, the roller coaster like cars clickety click click get mm-hmm. pulled up to the top and then you're let free and it's like a zipping roller coaster down. And the first one you go into is this underground cavern with these stalactites and stalagmites. And and as you go in that, you look way, way ahead up at the top of the lift and you see this waterfall and it's coming down and it's hitting this um, sort of stalagmite over the track and it splits into two. So there's water falling down on either side and you get to go through the middle. And it, it's kind of a fun thing. Um, and so I was in charge of finishing the selection of the pumps and everything to make sure that worked. Now... We as designers always had this little bit of a beef with Disneyland the park in that, and this is true in a sort of attention in most organizations, the designers create this crazy stuff and then the maintenance guys are stuck with making it work. Mm-hmm. And so if you can turn it down a little bit, it usually lasts longer. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so we don't want to run this at full speed or we don't want to run this as bright and then everything will last longer. And, and so we would go down on these periodic walkthroughs and make sure that the maintenance folks hadn't turned stuff down. So I was, and, and there's all these tunnels that you can crawl through the rides and, and Big Thunder Mountain. And so when the car, those roller coasters, they come through every few minutes. But in between time, it's quiet in there. And I had a colleague with me, um, and we went in there. And I looked up, and I thought, the daggone waterfall, these daggone maintenance guys have turned it down. It's just a drizzle. And I thought, this is a really key part of the first part of this ride. And I knew where the valve is. And I <laughs> and I said, Ira, I'm going to go down to that valve, and way down this tall steel ladder to the underground i said i'm going to turn it up and you shout at me when it's up where it's supposed to be now what i didn't know is the maintenance guys hadn't turned anything down they'd gotten some dirt because it was a new ride it had plugged up one of the filters so so it, at that particular time they hadn't changed the valve at all i didn't know that i went down there and i opened a little bit and i said ira is it running yet and he and he says a little more and then i turned a little more and then i all of a sudden it got really noisy because this <laughs> carload of people had entered and Roller coasters that are really loud, the the things they call anti rollbacks, which keeps them from sliding backwards. Clickety click, clickety click. And I, I reckon you hear him shouting, and, and I'm hearing some back in it. So I'm thinking he's saying more and more. I'm opening more and I'm opening. <laughs> and, then, and then all of a sudden, it wasn't Ira screaming. I hear this deafening screaming of like masses of people. So I climbed up this, this ladder. It was like two story steel ladder. Climbed up the top, and I looked to my right at the cars coming up. And usually, people, when they're on a roller coaster, they hold their arms up in the air and they have this kind of smile on their face. It looks of, of abject horror and people str- and they have this lap bar that keeps you locked people were not holding on they were struggling trying to get out of this thing and i thought oh oh my and i looked to the left and i turned it up so much that the, it jumped over the plug filler and there was this humongous waterfall 700 gallons per minute it was what that <laughs> pump was capable of pouring right down on the track i mean this was like a, a wall of water like i don't know felt like four a foot thick and this, and I looked, I could do nothing, and I was peeping over the stalagmite, and this train load of desperate people just like <laughs> like right through the middle of that. I thought, I am so fired. This is, I love Disney. I wanted to work here. I, this is my last day. I don't know, whatever. And I raced down the ladder again, out the tunnels, raced up to where they unload the people to the to the. And I'm remember this. I'm in my first year here. I'm just a kid, right out of college, and there's people this famous park that's been here and who knows people got Nikon cameras that are ruined I'm th- all these <sighs> things going through my mind and I said to the supervisor I've done something really really dumb he said well let's see what happens and the car came in fortunately it was a hot summer day and we had lovely guests and they were <laughs> soaked to the skin <laughs> did but, you know but this laughing. was a water oh. ride <laughs> <laughs> yeah right so uh, oh I uh, well, but what did you learn from that? I mean, that's pretty uh, amazing that you didn't get fired. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know that that I would have because Disney was a, I would have I, they would have, I would have gotten a good scolding. Um, but they, I mean, I think what anybody would have realized is here's a kid who works for us who really is passionate about making sure that the guests get the best experiences, and and I was. Um, being a little too assertive instead of checking things out, I just went in and opened the valve. Right, so um, youth, youthful um, vigor and all that. And uh, but that's that's the kind of company it was where you could you would you would push the limit and do great stuff and uh, you know all mm. kind of laugh about it later. Oh my God, I so many great stories. I want to drill, drill in more, but I want to get to the, the sort of three questions that I like to ask everyone. So sure. the first one is, what does success look like for you in the future? What what are you aiming for? Um, 
Well, I could give you a, 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 the inspirational answer, but let me let me give you one that's a little more grounded. Um, it's hard to keep uh, to build a company. Most companies, I don't know what the percentage is, vast majority of them might fail when they're in their first few years. And Hank Riggs, who was a professor, uh, was teaching entrepreneurial related business classes. And he said, if you start your own company, he says, there's two things you must avoid. He said, most companies fail because they're undercapitalized. Do not even dream of starting a company without sufficient capital because you'll, you'll just die. Cash is king. And second of all, find something where somebody else is kind of beating the path. Don't think you're, you've got a new idea in a new field and do that. Because unless you're Intel or somebody like that with massive amounts of research and development to, to afford to get past all these mistakes, you'll die. Uh, well, see, I'm sitting here um, 35 years later to tell you you can violate both those rules and still be sitting here giving an interview, okay? Because <laughs> we had no cash and, and we, we literally created mm -hmm. what's now known as uh, the fountain industry as we know it. Um, but it's, it hasn't been without its bumps along the way. We certainly felt it in the 2008-9 financial recession and, and you know various other things along the way. Um, and, and it isn't like you're a part of, uh, you know, uh, General Motors or something, and you just call up corporate and say, "Whoops, I made a mistake. Can you wire me another ten million dollars, you know, to cover payroll or something?" Uh, we we've always just been self-funded and and making our own money. So, um, I I just put that out there that you you, you don't want to be afraid to try, but you 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 really need to focus on developing your ideas and and your market and and surviving. I, I finished an interesting book by a gentleman named uh, Talib T A L E B. Uh, brilliant guy, and he wrote a book called Black Swan. You may have read it, and he and he talks about crises that hit everybody, nations, uh, down to individuals in their personal life and everything in between companies. And you really cannot predict in the world when when uh, what he calls a black swan, which is the potentially enormous surprise mm -hmm. negative hits happen. Yeah. So we're we've been pretty doggone good thirty five years at, at um, you know bouncing around in that. But in answer to your question, um, we have some I think really smart ideas I wish I'd have had a couple decades ago about building a more um, uh, Talib calls it anti-fragile side of the company that, that isn't as vulnerable to the ups and downs because they take the fun out of it you know you're doing all this great stuff and innovating and stuff and then suddenly there's a huge worldwide recession and, and uh, we have a, a, an incredible amount of intellectual property patents I, I look at my uh, bill from our patent attorney sometimes um, scares me but uh, <laughs> that's just a hallmark of the innovation that happens here at wet and it's it's really great um to do wonderful giant projects and and they're accessible to everybody i mean you can stand at the bellagio fountain i'm very proud of this and you can be standing next to rupert murdoch on your left and and a homeless person on your right and they're both enjoying the same thing you don't charge to see a wet mm -hmm. feature. It, it is, I don't know what other kind of universal entertainment is available that mm -hmm. somebody isn't saying, you know, give me a credit card. I think we're really unique in that mm -hmm. aspect because we do these projects for people like Mr. Wynn who realizes the value they bring to his property and then they help him make more money. And he's, he's brilliant in that respect. So um, I would say the clients we work for are, are all brilliant in that respect. But we're going to take and democratize that even further be, and bring some of the magic that we're able to do with the elements. And I, and I, and I won't um, spoil your, your future uh, mm -hmm. experience or unveilings with a lot of detail, but bringing this into things that, that are accessible to people to bring into their homes. Mm -hmm. And that gives us a, a much broader base uh, as opposed to, like I say, the, the, the uh, vagaries of sometimes the real estate and development market, but also continues what has been my mission since forming this company, which is to make the wonder and magic and beauty and delight of of the one true wonderful element on the planet, water, um, to everybody. I love that. So then what keeps you up at night the most? <laughs> what are you the most uh, worried about? <laughs> um, there isn't there isn't any one particular thing. I as as the founder and owner uh, you, you know, I I consider myself a pretty responsible person, so I've got my kids and wife to take care of, and then I've got all these hundreds and hundreds of families here, and then I've got our clients who are depending on, when I say me, I mean my uh, the whole team, but it feels very personal to me to deliver a, an amazing experience uh, every time because they're trusting me with a bunch of money mm -hmm. and, uh, the you know, the front door of their properties in, in most cases. 
And so um, I'll keep thinking, what are we going to do to make sure this is absolutely fantastic, absolutely <laughs> fantastic? Now, what is, this is the last question is, what is the one thing you wish you had known before you started that you might want to share with other entrepreneurs? Um, don't break those two rules. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you did. <laughs> Even though I did. No, if we, if we had... Uh, you know, and I, and I I own this place, right? I mean, it's it's not like we've got investors and I have to worry about Wall Street quarterly reports, and that's a great deal of of freedom. Um, but it does mean that you've bootstrapped, and it takes a lot longer to do that. So I would I would say to you have to you don't want to sell your soul to some investor who wants to just flip your company and and and, and you know make a few bucks and get out of it and doesn't care about your dream you want to protect that dream but it it does help to have um resources and uh i i probably would have picked a a, a marketing person as a as a founding partner um when, when i was putting together my first few group of of friends because it's it's all about um, I mean, I, I think I'm pretty good at, at going out and, and presenting uh, to our clients, and, and I enjoy doing it, but you can't do everything. Right. And we have a fabulous uh, 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 Teresa Powell's head of our business development and her team here now. Uh, but in the very early days, we didn't. It was a little too dependent on me, so I would have jiggered the, the initial mix a little differently there. It's really wonderful to see a company that has been bootstrapped to such success when this day and age everyone's just focusing on how do you get the biggest investment or go to the IPO, flip the company, get acquired. Um, so that is that is really great to see that model. Is there anything I should have asked? Um, it's so neat to see the diversity of the people that you have here and the way that you've been able to bring them together. I think that there's a lot of really great lessons that we can learn not only to to stimulate innovation in our own companies and in our own organizations, but also to bring the best out in people. So it's just really great to see that. Yeah, it, you know, this is the longest time I've sat probably in my office or part of my office in, in an age. I do, people say, what do you do? I say, I walk around all day, you know, and because people tend to form their own, even in a small company like this, their own little groups. And the key is to just um, constantly stir people up did you talk to charlie over the, did you know somebody with in that other department is tinkering with something that might be helpful to you no i didn't know that <laughs> uh, and it surprises me sometimes that a company even as small as ours but it's it still takes the, the chef still get, has to stir the batter yeah <laughs> right 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 and you're pulling for such a great base here too so we just have such a diversity yeah, in the do. city as well that's a great thing about la yeah well thank you so much for your time thank you z it's been really fun I just love Mark's philosophy around how to build a culture of innovation. I think the three most useful lessons were, first, diversity of thought is critical to nurturing a creative culture. Mark's company hires everyone from textile engineers and robot designers to woodworkers and choreographers. Second, despite the team's diversity, his team members must all have certain things in common to make the cut, like curiosity, commitment, and a positive attitude. Skills and knowledge are important too, but that's the easiest to train for later. Finally, don't just hire well. Give your team good tools to keep learning. It doesn't necessarily mean a million dollars in the finest woodworking tools or a million dollar vapor deposition chamber. Most importantly, it means giving them the training to have confidence and to play a part. The way WET has regular workshops and encourages everyone, even the receptionist, to roll up their sleeves and make things builds a culture where everyone can contribute their ideas. Oh, and one more thing. If you almost drown a train full of Disneyland guests, admit your mistake as quickly as possible and hope for the best. You might just get away with it. Time to wrap it up for the art of manufacturing. Tune in next Thursday when we meet Jessie Janae of Lumi and learn how she's reinventing packaging in this new era of direct-to-consumer retail. Visit makeitinla.org for show notes and to stay in the loop about events, news, and resources. To chat with other like-minded manufacturing entrepreneurs, join our Facebook discussion group at makeitinla.org slash community. Never miss an episode. Subscribe on iTunes, Google Play Music, or your favorite player. And if you like the show, do us a big favor and leave us a review. Or send us a message with feedback and ideas on Twitter at WeMakeItInLA. This podcast is produced by At Large and Dangerous in collaboration with the Make It in LA initiative and other partners. A big shout out to Peter Brandenburg, the producer and audio engineer, and our content coordinator, Heidi Carrion. Thanks for listening to The Art of Manufacturing. I'm Z Holly, and remember, don't just make it, make it.